Okay, Revelation 14. Uh, we're going to look at verses 14 through 20. We're finishing this chapter. Uh, verse 15, essentially, or chapter 15 really starts a new uh, section, so it worked out perfectly that I'm going to be on a break here for a couple of months. Um, we're going to close out 14, and then we'll pick up 15, then come beginning, uh, I don't know, February, whenever I'm back on again, March. Uh, let's go ahead and read chapter 14, 14 through 20, and then we'll, uh, we'll work through it verse by verse. <clears throat> chapter 14, verse 14. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and seated on the cloud one like a son of man, with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud. Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, the angel who has authority over the fire, and he who called with a loud voice to the one who sat, who had the sharp sickle, put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city and blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for 1600 stadia. Okay, remember last week we saw the angel proclaiming in verse 7, verse 7 said, And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. So in today's text we see John having another vision of the final judgment. This isn't the first time in the book of Revelation where we've seen symbolic images, visions that John has had, um, portraying and symbolically referring to the last judgment. We have seen this multiple times. This has been the foundation of my argument with regards to cyclical recapitulation or chronologically linear. How do you understand the book of Revelation? Is it cyclical recapitulation? Or is it chronologically linear as the events in Revelation unfold the book of Revelation? Uh, or those events uh, unfold equally in history? I think it's clear. Um, it's cyclical recapitulation. That's the view. That's the proper way to understand what's going on in Revelation. It's a repeating of the same thing over and over and over again. Yet again, we see a repetition, a repeating of the final end day judgment. We saw it earlier in chapter 6, verses 12 through 17, as well as chapter 11, verses 15 through 19. We'll see it again in chapter 16, verses 17 through 21, as well as chapter 19 and verses 17 through 21. So we see in these, in these verses um, the symbolic image, vision that John saw, which is referring to that last day, divine wrath final judgment. Now, the main, and like we've said throughout the study of Revelation, in order to understand what's being communicated, what these images, what these visions are referring to, in order to understand that, you need to have the Old Testament. The Old Testament provides us a road map. Um, it provides us a foundation to understand and properly interpret John's apocalyptic visions, because remember what the word apocalyptic means. Apocalypsis isn't talking about end times, although these verses are talking about the final judgment. Apocalypsis is referring to an unveiling, right? There is a curtain being pulled back on the physical to show the readers of Revelation what's really going on in the spiritual behind it. But in order to understand and be able to interpret from the physical to the spiritual, you need the book of Revelation. So for this particular text, these verses today... The Old Testament passage, there are several, but the one main one that provides uh, guidance that informs, if you will, the vision, or perhaps a good way to say it is the rebar of the vision, where this vision is going. What is John thinking of as he's seeing this vision? He's thinking of Joel 3, no question about it. So let's look at Joel 3, because uh, Joel 3, we see divine judgment, being poured out, 
and it's being pictured or symbolically referred to as a harvest and a wine press. Both harvest and wine press. All right, let's look at Joel 3. Uh, we'll go 4 through 8, and then we'll go to the next section. This is going to give us context. What's going on in Joel? Um, why is God pouring out wrath? Who is he pouring out wrath on? And then we're going to see how this, this divine judgment is being symbolically portrayed as a wine press and a harvest. Joel 3. What are you to me, O Tyre and Sidon, and all the regions of Philistia? Are you paying me back for something? If you are paying me back, I will return your payment on your own head swiftly and speedily. For you have taken my silver and my gold and have carried my rich, my rich treasures into your temples. You have sold the people of Judah and Jerusalem to the Greeks in order to remove them far from their own border. Behold, I will stir them up from the place to which you have sold them, and I will return your payment on your own head. I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the people of Judah, and they will sell them to the Sabines, to a nation far away, for the Lord has spoken. Verse 11. Hasten and come, all you surrounding nations, and gather yourselves there. Let the nations stir themselves up and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Go in, tread, for the winepress is full. The vats overflow, for their evil is great. God is bringing judgment on uh, the wicked nations that have persecuted, uh, sold in to slavery, um, Judah and Jerusalem. And this judgment is being pictured as a harvest in a wine press. Okay? So it's God's judgment there, pictured as a harvest in a wine press. The end judgment, the final judgment, also in Revelation 14, is now being pictured as a wine press and uh, a harvest, okay? Um, <clears throat> and it is ultimately, instead of divine judgment falling on these nations in Joel, what's happening in Revelation 14 is divine judgment falling on the wicked world system, the Babylon-like world system. All of the wicked nations across the globe, one day, final judgment will fall. All right, so let's move through these sections. Uh, if I was to divide these three up, or these, these, this section up into three sections, I would say uh, that verse 14, we see the Son of Man returns. Uh, verses 15 and 16, we see the victorious king reaps. In verses 17 through 20, we see the God of wrath judges. If I was to boil this section down into a main point, what's the purpose? What's the main idea? What's the Holy Spirit through John trying to get across, or not trying, is getting across, right? He's not trying would imply that there's a possibility of him failing. For those that the book was written to, to the people of God, the Holy Spirit will guide them into understanding what's going on here. And the main idea for the early church, when this was initially written to, the seven literal churches in Revelation 2 and 3, as well throughout time until he comes back, the main idea here is to provide hope to persecuted believers by reminding them of the glorious return of the king, and to provide assurance that judgment will one day fall on those whom persecute them. All right. Let's go ahead and look at the Son of Man returns in verse 14. Pretty simple. Verse 14. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and seated on a cloud, one like a Son of Man, with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. So notice the crown of thorns has been replaced. We see Christ with a golden crown uh, now identifying him as a victorious and returning king. It is clearly Christ that's being symbolically portrayed here. Uh, the picture of Christ on clouds is something we see both in the Old Testament and New Testament. Let me, I'm just going to go through a couple of verses. They're not going to be on the screen. It's just a couple of verses of, uh, of Christ being pictured coming on a cloud, being on a cloud. Revelation 1, 7, earlier in the book, we read, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. Matthew 26, 64, Jesus said to him, You have said so, but I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Acts 1, 11. 
uh, men, and, and the angel said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Remember, he was taken up in a cloud. Daniel 7, verse 13, Old Testament passage. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like the Son of Man, and he came to the Ancient of Days, and he was presented before him. So we see, here's a good example of how the scriptures help to help us in interpreting verse 14 of chapter 14. Who's this one coming on the clouds? Well, I just showed you how the Old Testament and New Testament help provide us the proper interpretation of who this is symbolically referring to. It's Christ. Amen? All right. The question is when? When is he coming on the clouds? Well, some preterists believe that this vision actually shows God's judgment on Jerusalem and that this is actually referring to Rome uh, conquering Jerusalem and destroying it in 7 AD. But it just, make, it just seems like this is final judgment language. This is like second coming, the game over, he is returning back um, to judge the dead, raise the dead, judge both the dead and the living. And uh, so, yeah, I, I think that some of, some of these, some preterists, um, I think they have a flawed view. I think this is clearly talking about Jesus' second coming at the end. All right, so let's move on to uh, verses 15 and 16, and we see the victorious king reaps. In verse 15 and 16 now, and for the rest of 15, 16, and then 17 through 20, we see the purpose of his return. Like what's, what's going to happen? What's the result of him coming on the clouds? And I would argue it is to gather and to judge. Verse 15. And another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud. Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So he sat on the cloud, swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. <clears throat> who reaped? Christ did. Christ is pictured here in, as being the reaper in this case, in this section, 15 and 16. Uh, to reap, uh, I looked at the definition of what it means to reap. One definition of to reap is to gather. Um, another definition is to receive a reward. I found that interesting. Because when I'm looking at this, because there's some debate as to what's going on in 15 and 16 in comparison to 17 through 20. Um, this gathering to oneself, this gathering and receiving a reward, to me, seems like right here, he's what's being mentioned to or what's being alluded to, what's being referenced to, what's being... What this is pointing to is to the moment in history when the believers, God's chosen, the people that will be in heaven, will be brought in. When the dead in Christ will rise and those who are alive upon his second coming will be brought to him. Now remember, it happens like that. A twinkling of an eye. When we talked, when we, we months ago, when I talked about the rapture, I put forward multiple views on what I believe rapture means. We talked about a couple of passages that referred to to meet him in the air, the first Thessalonians passage. This is really important because I think all of that rapture conversation, I believe, um, not, not, when I'm looking at this and I'm thinking about the logistics of how this could happen in the past, I think this, the, the, what I put forward during that rapture conversation is, is, is here, is accurate. And that is, upon Christ's second coming, uh, 1 Thessalonians, and then there's a passage where um, uh, Paul goes out, and, the, and yeah, the passage in 1 Thessalonians, who were to meet him in the air and change in the twinkling of an eye. The passage where Paul is on his way to Rome, and he has two brothers that comes out, come out and meet him, as well as the, the, the ten virgins, when the bridegroom is coming. The ten virgins, right, they go out and they meet the bridegroom. So that word, and if you need reference, go back to the rapture video that we have in the Revelation uh, playlist. That word, to meet, means to go out and meet, and the person who goes out turns around and accompanies the person who's coming 
back to where the people who went out to meet started. For example, it's the same word to meet. You see Paul. Paul is journeying to Rome, and that's where he's going to die. Paul is the one coming to Rome. There are two brothers who come out and meet Paul, turn around, and accompany Paul all the way back to where they were, which was Rome. It wasn't Paul's coming to Rome, they come out and meet, and then they turn around and go back to where Paul was. Same thing with the ten virgins. The bridegroom is on his way. The ten virgins go out and meet the bridegroom and return back to where the virgins were. The, as the bridegroom is on his way, the virgins don't go out, meet him, bridegroom turns around, and then they go somewhere else for three and a half or seven years. They, upon, they meet him and, upon, and accompany him back to where he was initially going. Does everybody understand that? If you need more clarity, go to the rapture video. I think there was a two-part series on the rapture where I presented the different cases, and I said, here's where I'm at. And the core for me was this word, to meet, and how it's used in the New Testament, and I believe all three times it's referring to that. Boop, boop, boom. Coming back. So, with that said, in verses 15 and 16, I think that's what we're getting a picture of, essentially. I think it's another way of talking about that moment in history that hasn't come yet. Sorry, some preterist. Um, in that moment in history that we all long for, if we're dead, we'll be raised from the dead. If we're here when he returns, we'll meet him in the air. And I believe we'll turn around and follow him right back down for him then to bring final judgment on those that were not brought up to him, which would be the unbelievers. So in the context of 15 and 16, <clears throat> I know when we see sickle, we automatically think judgment. But we have to be careful because the context of the passage will determine if the sickle being used is a sickle of judgment or if it's a sickle of harvesting wheat, right? Because how do they harvest wheat? Remember in some of these passages, which we'll look at, um, actually, let's go ahead and jump to it. Let's jump to Matthew 3, and I'll, look at, I'll show you the passage here. Jesus says, I baptize you. No, I'm sorry. Um, this is John the Baptist, right? Yeah. John the Baptist uh, says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me, talking about Christ, is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into his barn. There's a gathering. Wheat being symbolic of who? Believers. But the chaff will, be, uh, will, will burn with unquenchable fire. The chaff is symbolic of who? Unbelievers. Okay, so right here, notice the, 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 the one who's being gathered in here would be the wheat, the believers. Um, sickle are used. This winnowing fork is something that's used after the sickle is used. If you're a farmer, you go out and there's wheat growing in the field, you would use a sickle to cut down the wheat and bring the wheat in. It's a tool to use to, to, to harvest. The winnowing fork, this is a picture of after the sickle was used, the wheat would be brought into the barn. The winnowing fork, this is what would happen. There would be a big old pile of wheat. The winnowing fork would be used to, into the wheat and they would throw the wheat up in the air and continue doing that. And the wind would blow the chaff away into a pile and the wheat would eventually fall down and you would be left, after you kept doing that over and over and over again, you would be left with a pile of wheat. Chaff blown away into a pile. The wheat would be brought into the, the, uh, the farmer would bring it in and the chaff would then uh, be gathered and thrown into the fire. Okay? But a sickle would be used to bring in the wheat. So that's a tool. Here for the harvesting. It's symbolic of this process of harvesting. So we've got to be careful to not add judgment to the context of the sickle if the context of the verses doesn't allow it. I think in the next verses, it does. I think in verses 17 through 20, we are talking about a sickle and the theme of judgment because we see wrath and wine press and stuff like that. But I think verses 15 and 16 is a picture of essentially this going on, gathering his wheat gathers his people to him, right, upon his return. 
So now that we've seen that upon Christ's second coming, coming on the clouds, clouds, he will gather his people to him, and I believe from a rapture perspective, like I said, that we'll meet him in the air and then we'll return, at which point he'll say, hey angels, come on down. Those who haven't been raised from the dead and caught up in the air to meet him, meaning those that are the unbelievers or the unredeemed, now the angels are going to come down and then we see the, the wrath of God bringing judgment on them, which is what I'm saying is pictured here in verses 17 through 20. So let's go ahead and look at 17 through 20. We're going to see the God of wrath judges. 17. This is so horrific. It's sickening. Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, the angel who has authority over the fire. And he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle. Put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel, this is the first angel, the second angel says to the first angel, put in your sickle. So then this second angel, um, sorry, this, the second angel tells the first angel, put in your sickle. So the first angel here, so the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it. Notice the throwing or the discarding into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia. So notice the angel, come, where the angel comes from. Verse 18. It was the temple for the first one, and then the second one. And another angel came out from the altar. In the book of Revelation... That altar has been present, the theme of the altar. The big one that, bring, that comes to mind is in chapter 6. Let me read it to you. When he opened the fifth seal, <coughs> I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? So I believe here in chapter 14, verses 17 through 20, is John's vision of the moment when those prayers in chapter 6 are answered. Let me say it again. With the presence of the altar here, the angel coming out of the altar, the theme of the altar, the presence of the altar in this vision, it connects us to the altar that was present in Revelation 6. And what do we see? Souls of those who had been martyred. And they pray, when are you going to bring judgment and wrath on those who persecuted and killed us? And they're told, wait a little longer until the number of your fellow servants who are to be martyred like you are will be martyred. Chapter 14, verses 17 through 20 is a picture of those prayers being answered presence of blood, uh, altar. This is the moment in which the persecutors, uh, the unredeemed, the enemies of God will face the wrath of God. So not only does this 17 and through 20 allude and connect us to chapter 6, it also does the same thing. It connects us to Revelation, I'm sorry, Matthew 13, um, verses 36 through 43. So let's take a look at a couple um, similarities here. It's all the same stuff. It's, it's talking, it's just multiple ways throughout the scripture that are being, that, that, are, that are Matthew 13, Revelation 6, Revelation 14. It's all the same talking about this moment in history that is to come. When we go through this, I want you to pay attention to this concept of the throwing, the discarding where wheat, the farmer would have gathered to himself the wheat. The chaff was thrown. Notice that the grapes here are thrown into the wine press, discarded. Matthew 13, 36 through 43. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples came to him saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. 
He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man, the field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. That's what we see in Revelation 14 here. It's a picture of the end of the age. We also see angels are the ones who are the angel from the temple, angel from the altar, coming and, and reaping and, and uh, bringing this uh, judgment. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. Notice the, the theme of discarding and throwing into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, and the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has an ear, let him hear. So again, final judgment is described here, and it's described metaphorically using a wine press, using wine press-like language, which is again consistent with the rest of Scripture. In fact, we also see it in the Old Testament. Let me show you a passage in Isaiah 63. And notice the similar themes going on in Isaiah 63 as what we're seeing in Revelation 14. Uh, I have trodden the winepress alone. This is God speaking. And from the peoples, no one was with me. I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. That's what you do with the grapes in a winepress. You're stomping and smashing them. And that's how the, you, you harvest and then make wine. So you see the trampling them in, in his wrath. Their lifeblood... Notice the presence of blood, this horrific, violent picture. Lifeblood spattered on my garments and stained all my apparel. For the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption had come. I looked, but there was no one to help. I was appalled, but there was no one to uphold. So my own arm brought me salvation, and my wrath upheld me. I trampled down the peoples in my anger. I trampled down the peoples in my anger. I made them drunk in my wrath and I poured out their lifeblood on the earth. Notice the pouring out of their lifeblood, this horrific picture. There's also a touch, a hint of the gospel here. My arm, where is it, my arm? Come on, where are you at? There it is right here. So my arm brought me salvation. There's a picture of the gospel where Christ himself stepped into the wine press of God. The wrath of God and received the wrath. Because every human being, the wine press of the wrath of God will be applied to every human being. Either if you are in Christ, it was applied to him. He took the wrath of God himself. Or if you reject him, then you will be looking forward inevitably to the moment when the wrath of God, you will be in the wine press and receive the wrath of God. So there's a hint of the gospel here, but he's also talking about the last day too, the final judgment. Notice the amount of blood here I poured. It wasn't a drip. It wasn't a, uh, a, a, a small amount, but we're talking, this language is a overwhelming amount of blood which is exactly what we see in chapter in verse 20 in Revelation 14. It's a picture. Um, it's, a, it's painting a horrific, overwhelming picture of wrath and terror and horror. And the winepress was trodden outside the city. Blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia. So again, it's a picture of a tremendous amount of blood. Uh, 1,600 stadia is a measurement of width or distance. Um, <clears throat> a long, long distance. Miles upon miles. And so high, as high as a horse's bridle would be high. So this is a picture of blood so high and so far that you can't even see. Um, that's being painted here. That's how much. And that's the terrible reality of the wrath of God being poured out on the masses who reject him, the masses who persecute his uh, church. Because remember, 
This was initially written to believers in uh, those early seven churches who were facing persecution, um, as well as to believers throughout time. Let me read this section one last time. <clears throat> and then we can pray. Again, horrific. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and seated on the cloud, one like a son of man, with a golden crown on his head, and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So he, he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. And what I'm saying here is this is a picture of the ingathering of the people, of God, brought to Christ. And now we see a picture of what's going to happen to the, those who are not part of the family of God. Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, the angel who has authority over the fire, and he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, Put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung a sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, this reality makes me sick to my stomach. Uh, I know, though, it's you're just, and it's right. I think of the wickedness of this world, and I think I'm so thankful that I have a king who came and took the wrath on himself that offers me forgiveness for my wickedness. Help me to bow my knee to him and walk in obedience to his word, Father. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would continue uh, to be glorified in and through my life and that I would be pleasing in your sight. Lord, I pray for the same for my sons. I pray for Jack and Luke and Evan, their wives and children. Lord, I pray that they would be pleasing in your sight and that they would not experience uh, the wine press of your wrath. <clears throat> we love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.